It has been said that playing the game of billiards, or more commonly known as pool, is like having a love affair that constantly borders on love and hate. For those that indulge, it can bring feelings of heated exhilaration and intense passionate pleasure, or deep disappointment, frustration, and even anger. Though many have tried to understand, tame, or conquer this passionate lover, only a very few have gained her respect, a few whose names are immortalized in the game of pool. Jimmy, Boy Wonder, Karras, Rudolph, Minnesota Fats, Wonderone, Steve, The Miz, Miserac, Luther, Wimpy, Lassiter, and James, Cicero, Murphy, the first black person to be elected into the Billiards Hall of Fame. And now, another player extraordinaire has been nominated to join these and other legends of the game. And if elected, he will become the second black player to be inducted into the Billiards Hall of Fame. That player is none other than world-renowned professional trick shot artist Nathaniel Okinawa Slim Bryant. Slim, as he's called by close friends and fellow players, is known for being a gentleman, a professional, and for his compassion to help others. Although he has traveled the world, the story of Okinawa Slim started in Sanford, Florida, where he was born, and discovered his first love, the game of pool. I was born in a little small town in the suburb of um, Sanford, Florida, and it's called Midway. Midway is a location where uh, all my family members migrated at that time, and uh, I went to school there, uh, grades first through five, mid called Midway Elementary School. It was a nice community, it was well bonded. We all got together and helped each other out in that little small town. Well, you know, it, um, it was a very close niche uh, community. Um, I do have um, two other brothers. My oldest brother was named after my father, Willie Bryant Jr. And then me, my name is Nathaniel Bryant, I'm the middle child. And then I have a younger brother, his name is Calvin, Calvin Bryant. Um, my mother and my father, my mother passed away when I was about three years old. And so I really didn't get an opportunity to know her. So it was always my father that was actually uh, taking us every place where we really need to go. And he looked out for us. And my father also made that commitment to our mom that um, <clears throat> he would never remarry until we was old enough to take care of ourselves. However, we did have our grandmother who uh, took some time out and helped us along the way while we were going to school in that close community. So we had a village really watching over us the whole time as we were growing. It's a long story, my friend, but I started playing pool um, because of the fact that my father um, owned a pool hall. He owned a bar, he owned a restaurant, and he decided that he didn't want to have the bar, so he didn't want us growing up in it. So he sold the bar, maintained the restaurant and the pool hall. Um, every weekend, he, he would come and get us from Midway and take us to his pool hall, and we would learn so much on that table. And um, I really enjoyed it so much. He took time out with us. And it was a bond that we had that's something that you can't really explain. Um, and that bond is going on all these years right now. We still are close brothers and brothers at this time. Some say that I started playing pool when I was seven years old. But it was my brother that was really good at playing pool. And when people would come and get him and take him around, I got jealous, and I tried so hard to play and win. By the time I was 10 years old, I played my first money game for 25 cents. Of course, I was using my father's money, and the reason why I did it, I wanted to show them that I can play pool and I can gamble because my brother was doing it. When I lost that first game, my brother, I, whom I look up to, he told on me. He said, Dad, Nate playing pool with your money, and he's gambling. So the guy that I was playing pool with, he was about, I was 10 years old, he was about 14 or 15 years old. And my father came in 
and he looked at me, and he actually said, hey, uh-uh, no, you're going to play again, and you better win. And when I played that game, I won this quarterback. And then the, what he had stated to me, he said, now put your stick in the rack. The punishment that I received for that, I had to go to the restaurant and actually wash pots for, and the dishes for two weeks. And that's something I didn't want to ever do again. And I tried so hard to play pool when I, I was off that punishment. But again, I looked at my brother, and I think it was something good that he did, but it was also bad because he told on me. And I, to this day, you know, I still remember that situation. I really got into gambling. I really got into gambling when I was about 16 years old. Um, I remember it specifically because my father bought us a pickup truck. And at that time, I had my license, and I could drive. So I took my friends with me, and I just knew that I was good then because I went to a pool hall uh, with my friends in a, another city other than Sanford. Went into the pool hall, and they thought that um, I was a hustler. I started playing, and I was winning at 16 years of age. And I got ran out of, we got ran out of the pool hall. We left the vehicle, and we went back that evening to get the, pool, get the vehicle. And at that time, I knew that I was good when I had to run. <laughs> you know what? It was, you know, I did join the Marines, but let me say this. Before, you know, my brother and I, we used to talk, my brother and I talked all the time in the different, in the pool halls, and he said that he wanted to do something different in his life. And one day he woke up and he said he was going to join the Marines, but he went into the Marine Corps with a buddy. Uh, and when he got out of the boot camp, he came back to Pittsburgh and he says, you know what? I graduated. It was good. I enjoyed it. But you shouldn't go in because of the fact that it's too tough. Those are the exact words. You, you, it's too tough. You can't handle it. You know, it kind of remind me of, of someone telling me that I can't do something knowing that I can because I've uh, overcome a lot of different things in my life. Well, by him saying that, I decided to ask my friend to go into boot camp with me on the buddy program. He says, no, he's not going in this war. That's what he said to me. So I says, you know, I'll do it myself. So I joined the, I joined the Marines in 1977. But guess what? My brother told me that I couldn't do it and I couldn't handle it. Well, he spent four years in the Marines, whereas I spent 20. I did a career in the Marine Corps and it showed him that I can overcome a lot of different things and I outdid him at that time. I picked up the name Okinawa Slim when I was in the Far East Japan. When I, was in, um, when I um, joined the Marines, it was in 1979, I went to Okinawa, Japan. Of course, you know, I was really well slim. I was a little skinny little something, Link, tall, lanky Marine, that's what they called me. And then I got bored. Um, they had pool tables in the barracks, and so I never went anywhere. I got bored. I missed my family. I didn't have anything else to do. That was my hobby, it was playing pool. A friend of mine told me that there was a pool tournament going on that I should go enter it. Went to the Air Force Base on a weekend, played in that tournament, and I won that first pool tournament. And next thing you know, they say, oh, we have this tournament every month. So I told them, I said, hmm, I'm gonna win the next one too. I was really cocky at that time, because I was a Marine, of course. And I wound up winning four consecutive pool tournaments um, they asked me, um, wow, you were that good? I said, sure. And I, again, I was a little cocky when I said that. So uh, the newspaper reporter came out, did a story on me, and said, wow, I heard that you won four consecutive pool tournaments. Who are you? Um, I said, well, they called me Slim, you know, like that. He said, yeah, you are Slim. So with him saying that, then they, the article came out in the newspaper, Okinawa Slim keeps the pool circuit buzzing. And so during that time, that's when I picked up the title Okinawa Slim. From that point on, I said, you know what, by the time I leave this island, of course, you know, it was a 12-month tour, I decided to extend. I said, by the time I leave this island, I'm going to win 16 consecutive pool tournaments. They said nobody's ever done something like that. I won 16 consecutive pool tournaments, beat everybody on the island. I was rated as the number one pool player in the armed forces and in Okinawa, Japan. Sure did. True story. Got the records to prove it and got all these little dusty trophies. But yes, Okinawa Slim is how I come about that name.
you know what, I thought I was good. But my first pro tournament, it was in 1981, I remember. Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. And I thought I was good. But you got world champions playing in the tournament that I started competing in at the age of 22. These gentlemen were very, very good. They taught me something that I didn't even know. And, um, <clears throat> you know, here it is. You got 30, 32, 48 players in a tournament. And I wound up winning three matches. But the thing is, I learned a lot while I was there, and I really enjoyed it, and I try to pass this on to others. I want you all to know that I've looked up to a lot of players um, in the game of pool, um, one being my father. I've always looked up to my father. My father was a pro. He played good. He taught us a lot. Number two, um, I've looked up to Cicero Murphy. Um, he's the uh, first and only African-American inducted into the Hall of Fame, the BC Hall of Fame. Never got a chance to meet him directly, but my father talked a lot about him. Um, number three, I looked at um, Mr. Jimmy Carris. He's a five-time world champion. I looked up to him because he taught me my first three trick shots, and we had an opportunity to speak with each other while we were in um, San Diego, California. And number four is whom I look up to is Mr. Minnesota Fats. His name is Rudolph Wonderone. Um, he taught me what it was like to be a showman. Um, not only that, but Minnesota Fat was also a community person. And uh, he did a lot for people and for kids just as well. And those are the four people I look up to as professionals because they taught me something. And I listened and I learned. You know, the best advice I've received come from my father. I looked up to my father. And he actually stated to me, not only just me, but my brothers and I, he always said to us, be quick to hear and slow to speak. You may learn something. And didn't realize where it came from after reading the Bible. It actually came from the Bible. And so quick to hear, slow to speak, you'll learn something if you listen. What I enjoy, what I enjoy um, the most about pool is that some of the key things that goes back to what my father said to me, he said, you know, son, he said, you have a lot of knowledge. He said, but what good is that knowledge if you don't share it? So, you know, by listening to him and stating, him stating that to me, I thought it was so, so important to be around the youth and try and teach not only just the youth the game and the knowledge, but to share it with everybody. I enjoy being around the people and sharing that knowledge about the game. Three words. How do I describe myself in three words? Well, you know, there's a lot of words in a dictionary. But you know what? When you have a passion for something, a passion for people, a passion for situation, I describe myself, number one, as caring. I care about others. I care about situations. And I care about the game of pool. Um, I also look at integrity. Um, that's something, when you talk about integrity, that's one of the traits that's used in the military, integrity, is honesty. And I believe in that just as well. And loyalty, loyalty is something that goes a long way. Like I said, those are traits that actually come from a Marine, and I believe in that, and I live it. I'm very loyal to the people that I work with. I'm lo very loyal to my sponsors, and I'm very loyal to my family. You know, I officially started doing trick shots. Um, in 1983, I was at Caesars Palace, but those same three trick shots, when I met Mr. Jimmy Carris, he taught me those three trick shots, and I used that. I felt like that doing trick shots is a lot more entertaining because I learned from Mr. Minnesota Fats that um, you can be a showman. And so there are a lot of books out there on trick shots, and all I did was practice those trick shots and decide that, hey, I can do this. If somebody else can do it, I can do it just as well. Well, you know, it's been said, it's been said, when doing trick shots is not an easy thing. Um, there are books out there that are on trick shots that shows you the diagram, and then you get on the pool table, you practice them. But however, I used to dream about trick shots. No matter where I'm at, I think about it, I'll draw it up, and see if I can actually perform that shot. So a lot of the trick shots that I have, um, they come from books, and you just either... Um, <clears throat> 
add to it or take it away, take away from them. When I'm, when I'm designing trick shots, you know, usually it takes a, a few days, depends, before you actually perform it. Depends on the difficulty of the shot just as well. Um, I remember one shot that I actually did uh, practice a few years back, and now it's one of those shots that I use in my exhibition all the time. So sometimes it takes, it takes four or five days or so to actually put a shot together. Again, depends on the difficulty, whether you're trying to make 14 balls in one shot or you're trying to do nine balls on a, on a four and a half by nine pool table or a three and a half by um, seven pool table. A lot of it depends on the table and, and the claw as well before you can actually get out there and perform that shot. So you, you draw a design, if you will, or you put shots in categories based on the tables and then that's when you actually do it. I became the president, it's called the WPA APD, which stands for World Pool and Billiard Association, Artistic Pool Division, so it's a division under the, uh, the WPBA. Um, it was in um, 2006 when I was voted in as the president of that trick shot organization worldwide. Uh, I maintained that position for three years. Um, I was actually the first African American in the history of pool to maintain uh, 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 become president of a world organization in pool. I will give any advice, I will give any advice to anybody, and to include the young. Don't hustle. That's number one. Number two, stay in school. Get your education because that's going to help you out a great deal. Um, don't get involved with drugs. If you get an opportunity to play the game, learn it as a family, as a unit, um, and be smart about what you do. And be smart about what you say to others just as well. Give respect, respect yourself. Look at your attitude, look at your appearance. Um, those are some of the key traits that I think is so important. Uh, your attitude, your approach, your appearance. You know, I'm not trying to say stay away from smoking, but don't, don't smoke. Don't do no drugs, you know. I'm the kind of person that I don't do no drugs, I don't do no cursing. I mean, I try to live a quality life, but at the same time, I have faults and I try to improve upon them, and we all do. So I think it's important for the kids to learn, um, continue to have that self-esteem and stay in school. You know, I dreamed, I dreamed, you know, I had a dream about the future of pool. And if I have my opportunity to give my voice, this is an opportunity to do it now. Just like any other sport, there are gonna be hustlers and criminals who are always trying to do something the illegal way or to get ahead or get the edge on someone. But I think the youth are our future. And I think Whitney Houston said that best. The youth are the future. Well, we have to look at that in pool just as well. I think that we try to get our kids more educated in the game of pool. And not only that, um, with education, it comes to be, we have to be role models for the kids. I think they need to come out with the anti-doping policy. And, and when you're in major tournaments, everybody needs to be drug tested. You can't stop the ones that are in the local pool halls. You can't think or stop the ones that are in the bars. But if you're gonna really grow the sport and do it right, and these are things that we have to look at. One of the key things that I try to educate people on is giving back to the community. A lot of people don't do that. They think that just play pool, they become selfish and think about themselves. But these are some of the key things that I look at. Help others, no matter how old they are or how young they are. Help them, because we need it. Yes, I'm working with the youth program. Um, I have a program that, step that I, I've been working on um, for the last two years. 
It's called Billiard Awareness Month. And Billiard Awareness Month is something that I'm um, working with um, like nonprofit agencies, local government, and anybody that puts on an exhibition, have me out doing an exhibition, I try to encourage them to have youth involved to where the government will give them a proclamation. Um, I've already worked out a summer program uh, for one of the other nonprofit agencies. Uh, it's a summer camp that I do for pool. And I try to encourage them by the number. You know, when we talk about by the number, we're talking about something that has to do with um, education, the geometric system of the pool table, the geometric system of the game. Math is something that a lot of kids don't understand. So, you know, with that being said, we try to educate them on that. Um, and I have three exhibitions that are scheduled um, within the next six months to where they have a youth program, but they want me to come out and get more involved with them just as well. You know, one of the biggest accomplishments that I had was in 2009. I had a stroke in 2009. Um, I laid up in the hospital like a little kid all over a baby, a fetus position. And I remember one day that my minister called and said, Nate, God still has work for you to do. And with that being said, I felt like I can get up out of the bed and walk, but I know I couldn't. I had no motor skills whatsoever on my left side. Um, but they gave me some therapy. When they released me from the hospital, I had six months of therapy. One of the key things that I, I talked about with my doctor was, you know, I'm an accountant. I use my brains and not my hands. And I wanted to go back to work part-time, but they didn't see that um, because my left side still was kind of slow. And I had six months of therapy and my motor skills were coming back. Um, they allowed me to go back to work part-time and said that if anything should transpire, you know, we're going to take you away from your job. Mind you, I still had that phobia of driving. I could not drive. I would drive in the right lane, but I would drive slow. But that was one of the biggest, with the fan support, the family support, and others that knew what was going on in my life, you know, the support system was really there, and that helped me out. I know it was a stupid thing, but what happened also was I wasn't taking care of me. I was doing more for others than myself. I felt that it was important to have attention by going, flying, having a full-time job, traveling around, putting on shows, playing pool tournaments every weekend, traveling overseas to put on shows. But I wasn't taking care of my body. I wasn't eating correctly. So that woke me up. My other accomplishments was, biggest accomplishment was after playing pool for over 50 years, for me to be nominated for the Hall of Fame out of 40 million people. It says a lot to me that people do care, people do see you. When you least expect it, somebody's going to recognize you. It was an emotional time um, when someone called me up and said, you know what, we're going to nominate you for the Hall of Fame. Being the second African American in the world, to be nominated says a lot to me and the community as a whole. And lastly, which is sometimes very emotional to talk about, is my father. My father had an opportunity to watch me put on a, a big show, for, uh, ESPN wheelchair tournament, and he was also in a wheelchair. Um, they put the red carpet out and had an opportunity to film my father just as well. That was one of the biggest accomplishments that I, I, I wanted to see. My father, I always wanted to, for him to see me do well in pool because he brought me up in this game. And I love him, I miss him dearly because he has always been a support system no matter what happened in my life. He was always there. Slim, his vest is always pressed, his smile always bright. What kind of magic will Slim bring tonight? 
Will it be the machine gun? Maybe the butterfly? He makes it look easy, a gleam in his eye. The audience intent, wide-eyed and amazed, may not even realize the hours, the days, he diligently practiced to move this way. An ambassador, an artist, a mentor, a showman. All who know him are proud to call him our friend. Okinawa Slim has been an excellent ambassador for the game of pool and also for McDermott Q for over 35 years. He has performed all over the world and is actively involved with showcasing the sport to the community through the Boys and Girls Club, senior citizens, and others in need. We can't say enough good things about this Billiard Hall of Fame nominee. Thank you, Slim, for being a model ambassador for McDermott Q. This is Don the D and DNA. This is Ace of the A and DNA. What can we say about Okinawa Slim that hasn't already been said? Simply put, nothing. That's why he's one of the best budget players in the world. He's a person of integrity, character, loyalty, and honesty, which is rare today. That's why we feel it's a privilege to know him. And an honor to call him a friend. Slim is an inspiration and role model to many. He has a very positive attitude and sees the best in every situation. He gives every commitment 100% and has donated countless hours teaching others and traveling across the nation doing charity exhibitions. There has never been a better team player than Slim. He's the one guy that is going to sacrifice himself for the good of others. If Slim gives you his word, it's golden. You can take it to the bank. I see him as a really great ambassador for the sport of the billiards in this country and around the world. Uh, he's known and he's been uh, he's a very, very outgoing person and reaches out to young people and to elderly people and he's just a really good uh, indication of, of how this sport should be played and this sport should be operated. Um, so I, I, give him all, I give him all honor for being the person that he is. Hi, Jack Justice. Justice Cases. I'd like to say a few words about my good buddy, Nate Bryant, AKA Okinawa Slim. I met Slim back in the 90s at one of the tournaments and he came to our booth and asked if I would be willing to make him a case. Of course, I was very impressed with his accomplishments at the time and was more than happy to uh, oblige him. I've known Nate for many, many years, and he has done nothing but good for the billiard industry. Most of his work is volunteer work, and he doesn't get paid that much for it, but he really enjoys what he's doing. And I'd just like to say congratulations, Nate. You're doing an excellent job, and just keep doing the same thing that you've always done. Be honest and truthful and you're still one of my favorite persons in the billiard industry.